together. My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough. Let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you so much for being good to us. Thank you for this wonderful day that you have brought us that we may hear your word. Lord, you saved us from sin. Tell us this truth through your servant, Pastor Moes, who is going to speak to us. Give him your power, your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I take this opportunity to thank you for coming that we may worship together. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker of the hour, Pastor Mosimanegape Super Moesi. Pastor Moesi is a citizen of Botswana, but he is the director of Ellen G. White branch office for the African continent, and he is based in Adventist University of Africa here in Nairobi. We thank God for bringing him to us today. He has come to us together with the wife. I ask the wife that you may be able to stand. Sister Boipelo Moesi. She's not feeling well, but she has come to us. Please wave to us. God bless you so much, and thank you for accepting this service to come and minister to us. They are blessed with two girls, all adults, Lefika and Lefilwe. Pastor, please welcome. Come to minister to the children of God. May God bless you. We are happy that God has 
accepted that you be able to bless his children today. Please welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor, for that wonderful introduction. It's a joy and a blessing for me to be here. It's always a joy to be in the house of the Lord. And I want to repeat one more time that we are too blessed to be stressed to be in the presence of God. And this is our sermon title this morning that we are looking at to say, too blessed to be stressed. And somebody may ask himself or herself to say, how can you come up with such a queer title when people are in so much problems? Right now, as I'm sitting here, or as I'm listening to you, whether you are listening out there, whether YouTube or Facebook or whatever, or television, you may be saying, why such a title when I have a funeral right in my yard here? How can you talk about that when I have lost a job? Where are the blessings of the Lord? And I want to say to you today, Jesus Christ made it very clear. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it's not my words. It's not my wife's words. It's not any human being's words. But it is the Creator's words himself, Jesus Christ, saying, you are too blessed to be stressed. And how did he say that? In John chapter 16, verse 33, he is very clear. He says to the disciples, I have spoken these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Allow me to say it's only God who can say that. And let's come back to the Bible itself and try to see the source of, uh, you know, this Bible that we have today. And maybe before we go into that, let me just share with you that today is a Sabbath school day. And there are four objectives that Sabbath school actually proclaims, or four objectives that they are exi in existence for. Number one, Sabbath school is there for us to study the Word of God. And that is the one that we are going to focus on this morning. Number two, Sabbath school is there for us to fellowship, if you please, to one another, one anothering, fellowship together, love each other, warm each other on our way to heaven. Number three, fellow, uh, um, Sabbath school is there for us to do community service. Let not your faith end within the four walls of the church. Take it out because God wants to save the whole human race. And therefore, we cannot afford to be here and never fail to go and tell somebody, Jesus loves you. And number four, Sabbath school is there for world mission. We are not only here to preach the gospel in Kenya, but we have to go beyond the borders. You may not go there and preach as an individual, but you can send your offering, and a person in China may come to know that Jesus died for me at the cross. So as a Sabbath school member, these are the objectives for which we exist. But today, we are looking at the word of God itself. Allow me to say to you, we are too blessed to be stressed because we are created by God. And God always wants to be known. Hallelujah. God always wants us to know that he loves us. He always wants us to know what he wants us to do. In the beginning, when you go to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, the Bible tells us that when he had created Adam and Eve and planted the Garden of Eden for them, he himself will leave heaven, the splendors of heaven, and come to the garden on earth where Adam and Eve way and he will speak to them face to face and he will tell them that I love you and I want to say to you today the best sign of love the best illustration of love is the time that a person gives you if you are here a young person in the church or you are listening through the, the television or wherever you may be whatever platform you may be if somebody says I love you and they never ever give time to you and spend time with you you should know they are a liar and the devil is their father 
Because God, who created Adam and Eve, came down to the garden. And when you read verses 28 and 29, the Bible tells me that he came down, he touched them, and he blessed them, and he spoke face to face with them. God wants his children to see his face so that they can have joy, they can have peace, and they can have gladness in their lives. We are too blessed to be stressed when we have God in our lives. And then Adam and Eve decided to sin and listen to a different voice. And that was the voice of the devil. And in Genesis chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, the Bible is very clear that Adam and Eve had sinned, and the God of heaven, who would come to them before sin, could not come to them because if he came to them in his uh, divine power, they would have been immediately eliminated or deleted by his presence. And therefore, he came into the garden and he called. His voice was heard. He said to Adam, 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 where are you? And Adam said, I am hiding. For the first time, we hear a voicemail. It doesn't start with Safari Com. It started with Adam and Eve when he ran away from God. When people want to run away from others, even parents at times, when the deaths are too much, you say to the children, don't tell them that I am around. Go and tell them that daddy is not here. But the children in their innocence, they will come and say, daddy is in the house, but he says we should not tell you that he is here. By so saying, they are revealing. And God, when he says to Adam, where are you? He doesn't necessarily say, I don't know where you are. In actual fact, he's saying, what is it that you have done? Have you been elevated above me or to my place now because you listened to another voice? But thank God, when he is offended, he comes looking for the offender. That is love at its best. And I want to say to you this morning, if you feel unloved, if you feel you have done the worst sin in this world, God still has power to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just listen to the voice, the voice of God. And then God, because he couldn't come to them face to face, they were now on voicemail. He still wants to be known. He still wants to show us that he loves us. And what does he do? He decides to call prophets. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The Bible tells us, in the olden days, he spoke to our fathers through the prophets. And by the prophets, God showed the children of Israel and the whole world that I love you. Please come to me. I want to bless you. I want you to be my children. I want you to experience joy and peace in your lives. And where do we find the message that comes from the prophets? The Bible. The Word of God. I want you to know today that this is the only book in our lives that can deal with the negative stress in our lives. How can you choose a title, Too Blessed to be Stressed, when the world tells us, the World Health Organization tells us that there are over 280 million people who are depressed today. How can that be? How can you come and say this to us? It is because, brothers and sisters, one of the reasons we have run away from God, we are hiding. And the further we go away from God, the more stressed we become. And today, I'm here to say, this is the word of God, and this is where we can find the blessing that God has given us. In Romans chapter 5, 15, Verse 4, the Bible tells us that for whatever things were written before in this word were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, we may have hope. Oh, how many people are losing hope today? How many people are ready to commit suicide today? Simply because they don't know the west from the, you know, from the east. They don't know the south from the north. They don't know where they are. They found themselves in the wilderness of nothingness. They may be educated. They may be married. They may be salaried. But still, they feel life is useless and nothing really matters in this life. 
wife. Actually, last week we had a seminar and a friend of mine came from Malawi and he said to me, a young man who was doing very well in life, rich and moneyed, he left all the money in the bank. He didn't owe anyone. He didn't quarrel with his wife. Nothing wrong really that we can detect that we say he did. That probably cost him to do what he did. He just took a rope and hanged himself and he said, it's over for me. I'm tired of this life. And I want to say to you, when you don't have the author of life, Jesus, who says in John chapter 10, verse 10, a thief cometh to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Life will weary you before you even start living life. I want to say to you, life is found in Jesus. When we are in Jesus, we are too blessed to be stressed. Now the question is, why is the Bible so important? This is the question I just want us to answer. And we have four points, then I'll be done. I sit down. As I've already sh shared with you that the Bible is the voice of God. And God spoke to the prophets. And the prophets wrote the word of God as they were led by the Holy Spirit. In the interest of time, you can check other texts. But I want you to go check 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. That tells us that the men of God who wrote the scriptures wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And this word, therefore, when you and me open it and we pray, the same Spirit will come upon us and wake us up and give us a new life and a better life. Number one, why is the Bible important? The Bible is the foundation of prosperity in this life. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you don't have the word of God and you have no time to open the word of God and study the word of God, you will grope in darkness all the days of your life. If ever today you can get home and somebody asks you, why did you go to church? What message did you get? Just tell them, the preacher told me the word of God is the light for my life. In fact, in Ephesians chapter, three, chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible tells us that blessed be the God the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you want to live a Christian life, the blessings are found in the Word of God. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, He says that, Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a, a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did stand, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Dear brothers and sisters, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flowers fade, but the word of God standeth sure. Thank you for the song that we sang. My faith has found a resting place. Not in the fables of men, not in the theories of men, but it has found a firm foundation in the word of God, the word of God that came from the mouth of God himself. How powerful is this word? Allow me to share with you an experience that shows or reveals the power of God. I was preaching in one church in South Africa called Santon Church. And when I finished preaching, talking about the power of the word, a lady came, I'd never seen her in my life, and she came to the back and embraced me and kissed me all over. I don't think I've never ever been kissed in that manner by any other woman apart from my wife. And she said to me, Pastor, thank you for saving my life. 
I am here because of you. I said, but I don't know you. He says, yes, you may not know me, but I know you. I'm a native of Angola. One day I decided that life was over for me. I came back from work. I wrote my suicide note. I got everything ready that I was going to drink and then disappear out of this life. But the television was on. And as I checked, it was Hope Channel. And I heard your voice that I heard today in this church preaching. And somehow, something drove me to listen for two minutes. Before I knew it, 30 minutes was over and I'd forgotten about my suicide. And she said to me, Pastor, thank you so much. I want you to go and meet my parents. I drove with her to go and meet the parents. And I tell you, it was a great day that day. I want to say to you today, the word of God is the foundation of prosperity in this life. And how do I know? It is because four years ago, she called me and said, Pastor, thank you for the word. Because now I found a husband and I'm getting married. And two years ago, she called me and said, Pastor, guess what? I am pregnant. And I, I wish you could come and, and, you know, dedicate my child to God. I said, don't worry. We can pray for the child even far away from where you are. And the Lord will bless. And as I'm talking to you, she's a happy mother and a happy wife because there is power in the word of God. Church, Bible study is key for us to know the true faith in Jesus Christ. Point number two. The word of God gives us power to resist the devil. And the best example that we have in the word of God is Jesus Christ. When you go to Matthew chapter 4, I like the way the prophetess of the Lord Ellen White puts it. She says the hell was empty that day. All the grandfathers and grandmothers and all witches had left hell empty to come and attack the Son of God, Jesus Christ, so that you and me today could not say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. But the Bible tells me the Spirit drove Jesus Christ out into the wilderness. Oh, my brother, my sister, the wilderness is the worst place to be. But when you are armed with the word of God, it is the best place to be. Because you know your direction. One songwriter says, my God knows the way through the wilderness. You may be through the wilderness of death today, the wilderness of divorce today, the wilderness of sickness today, the wilderness of cancer today, the wilderness of children who have gone wayward today. But I want to say to you, my God knows the way through the wilderness. And the Bible tells me, that as Jesus was in the wilderness, the devil took advantage. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And as he came there, the devil, he says to Christ, if you are the son of God. You know, that's how the devil comes. He first plants what? Doubts. Have you heard a young man saying, if you love me, sleep with me. If you love me, kiss me. But Judas kissed Christ, yet he didn't love him. <laughs> One thing that is important as a child of God, when you are too blessed to be stressed, you are a person of value. Allow me to say to you, Nairobi Central Church, and whoever that is listening there, we have lost the study of God's word. That's why we value ourselves by the things that we have. You are of greater value of, than the things that you have. You are of greater value than the money that you have. A cell phone does not give you value. If you didn't buy it, no one would know that it's valuable. Oh, I stay in this suburb. That's a suburb. You are a child of God. You are not what you are because of what you have, but you are what you are because of whose you are. That's why he gives you power to make wealth and say, bring it back to me because you are more valuable than money. 
When you fail to return tithe, when you fail to contribute for camp meeting, and yet you have money, you are saying, money is more valuable than myself. And I want to say to you, you have greater value. That's why he created Adam and Eve. And he planted the garden. And instead of asking the animals to give the name to Adam, he said to Adam, I created it all for you. You give names to them, for you are more valuable than these things. Never rate yourself according to the world standard. Or they may say Bill Gates is the richest man. Why? Because he has money. But I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, we are of greater value than money. That's why Christ left heaven for you, regardless of what your status may be in the society. Yeah, I was just talking about that and I was carried away. But it has to be said. So Christ, then the devil comes and says, prove it that you are the son of man. Number two, number one, he says, prove it, in, inciting doubt. Number two, what does he say? He's inciting, he's trying to feed Christ's selfishness. He says, do it for yourself. Oh, allow me to say to you, when you read the Bible, you know that the devil really doesn't change his strategy. His strategy. The strategy is the same. Are you, are you aware of that? When he came to Adam and Eve, what was the first temptation? Food. And then what was the second one? You, selfishness. You will be like God. And when he comes to you and me, it's the same thing. Some of us, Today, as we are here, or some of us who are maybe in the hospital, you may be there and where you are because of the type of food that you eat. And then you may be where you are again because of selfishness. You feed selfishness. I want to say to you today, there has been the First World War, the Second World War, and there is no... You know, prophecy that there will be a third world war. But I want to say to you, it's raging on. And that war is self-denial. War against self that I can value other people in as much as I value myself. And I want to say to you, it's only the word of God that can do that. So the devil comes and he says, turn the stones into bread to prove to me that you are powerful. You are the son of God. But Jesus knew who he was. And he didn't only stand there. He said to him, I will quote to you the most powerful weapon against, against what? Against sinfulness. And he went to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Men shall not live by bread alone, but will live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is a powerful statement. This statement is actually saying to you and me that are listening that the word... Rather, the bread that we run to and fro for has no power to create the word, but the word has power to create bread. I don't know if you are following me. Those who decide and refuse to come and worship God on the day that he has set aside, they are thinking that the bread will sustain them, but the bread has a way of being depleted, but the word of God will create bread even for those who are not in their business place today. You don't have to worry. For Christ said, the word of God is powerful. Actually, in, in, in Psalms chapter 33, verse 6, the Bible tells us that through the word of God, the heavens were created. He said, let there be light, and the sun is still shining even this day. Praise be to God. Then he comes with the second temptation. What was te the second temptation? We find that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, he takes him up and he says, if you are the son of God, do what? Throw yourself down. Now, before he does that, he quotes from the scriptures. He says, when you throw yourself down, the Bible says, I want you to know, if you don't read the Bible and the devil reads the Bible, who is better placed when you come to, obviously, the devil? But I want you to show you something. The devil reads the Bible, but he doesn't read it with prayer. But when we read, we pray first, and then the Spirit of God illuminates us, and we understand better. 
So here there were two temptations again. Well, there were actually one. Let me say only one. He's saying to Christ, he's quoting, yes, that uh, God will take care of you. That is true. God does take care of us. But he's forcing Christ to be presumptuous instead of having faith. There's a difference between the two. Between faith and what? And presumption. Now, presumption claims the promises of God, but it's not ready to obey the word of God. But faith says, I will stand on the word of God. Even though the heavens fall, I will take God at his word, claim his promises on the solid rock. Christ, I stand even though the heavens fall. And Jesus quoted from the word of God, and he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. This is the best of all the weapons you can find against temptation. Sometimes I hear young people saying, Pastor, you really don't understand. The reason why I fell into this temptation, you have no idea. I may not have an idea, but Christ knows. Because his was the worst. And then the third temptation was uh, verses 9 and 10. Worship me instead of worshiping God. How many people are worshiping wealth today? How many people are worshiping prophets today? Or so-called prophets today? How many people are worshiping many other things apart from God himself? He says to him, he takes him up and he shows him the glory of the place. And he says, if you worship me, this will be yours. How many people today are told, don't worry. Once you come to me, you'll be the most prosperous person on this planet. And Jesus asks a question. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I want to say to you today, God is calling us to true worship. And the only way we can know true worship is through Bible study. The word of God is the only way that will guide us to where God wants us to be. In fact, I want to share with you four things or four detectors from the word of God, how to detect whether this person is following God or not. Number one, Isaiah 8 verse 19 and 20. The Bible there is very clear that if they do not speak according to this word and they claim to be prophets, there is no truth in them. It doesn't say part light. It says there is no light at all. I want to say to you today, when they come to you, when these deceptions and the wilderness seem to enshroud you in the darkness, come to the word of God. There is light. You sang a beautiful song that I love so much. Give me the Bible. Number two. The Bible is very clear that when they come to you and say to you, I am a prophet, ask them if their prophecy has been fulfilled. Jeremiah 28 verse 9 says, a true prophet's prophecy must be fulfilled. And if it is not fulfilled, then he is not a true prophet. However, I want you to note this, that the devil also can come up with ways to make it appear like the prophecy has been fulfilled. But God says, you have to know and understand through the word of God. Number three, John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Whoever says I'm a prophet must be clear that they believe Christ came as the Savior. Whoever claims I am Jesus now, it's a clear indication they are not a true prophet. And therefore, the word of God will always give you light. And number four, you will know them by their fruits. If he says, I'm a prophet, that is uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses two, verse 21 to 22. If he says, I'm a prophet, or she says, I'm a prophet, but here the Bible talks about monogamy, and he has all the women in the world, you can tell by their works that this is not a prophet of God. Therefore, Bible study and Sabbath school are crucial for you and for me. Let me share with you a story. True story. I was preaching the word in my country in Botswana. In a place called Serongai. I can name this because it's my country. 
and it's a true story. And as I was preaching the gospel, there was a man that was said to be the, the most powerful witch, witch, witch doctor in that area. And one evening he came to the meeting where we were preaching the word. And somebody said, you better be careful because the man is so powerful. And I said to them, the word of God is more powerful according to the book of Hebrews. It goes to the dividing of the soul. And when the appeal was made, this man stood up and he gave himself to Christ and he brought everything that he had and it was bent and he said to us, now I don't want to deal with the devil anymore. I found the power of God and I want to immerse myself in the word. The word of God has power, brothers and sisters, for us to resist the devil and he will flee from us. In fact, James puts it better. In James chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Actually, the Bible says, after Christ quoted the Bible three times, only three times, the devil ran away from him, and the angels came and attended him. Quote the Bible, you will walk with angels in your life. Number three. Point number three. The Bible is an antidote to stress. And I will not go much into this one because of, faith, because of time. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, Christ is very clear. He says, let not your heart be what? Be troubled. Believe in me. Believe also in who? In the Father. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus says to you and me, it's up to you to believe, not to be troubled. In other words, he's saying to you and me, stress is actually a decision. You decide to be stressed. Have you had parents saying to a child, you know, if you do this, you annoy me. You annoy me. Now I'm getting about, you know, you are cranking yourself to get annoyed. And then you hit the child and say, you see, you have annoyed me. You were letting yourself be troubled by what the child is doing. But the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. The answer is, believe in me and believe also in the Father. Number two, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, be anxious of how many things? How many of us here have never been anxious? Some are even anxious. Now, is he going to finish on time? <laughs> because that's the way, the way we live. Have you heard parents saying, this child is a stress? Have you heard people say, so this preacher is just a, a pain to me in my body? But Jesus says, be anxious of how many things? <laughs> By prayer and supplication with what? With thanksgiving, many of us are ever asking in prayer, we need to give thanks and praise the Lord Amen. in whatever circumstances. Allow me to, to, and then it says in verse 7, and the peace of God, that what? That surpasses all understanding. Will does what? Will do what? Will guard your minds. Some people are in hospital and in the mental hospital because their minds are not guarded by the power of the word. And Jesus says, in me you have peace. Some today are eating or drinking tablets, hot tablets and high blood pressure because their hearts are not submitted to Jesus. I want to say to you today, God is amazing. A story, a lady in South Africa some years back called me, the son called me and said, my mother is sick. Can you come over and pray for my mother? And I went there. When I got there, the old lady looked at me, and she, I was told she has only four days to leave. Actually, no, two weeks to leave. And I said, I've never prayed for a person who had two weeks to leave. How am I going to pray for this one? I went there as a pastor. I had no text to read. I didn't even know what to say. For a person who is about to die, cancer, fourth stage, finish. And when I got there, the lady turned around and said to me, oh, are you the pastor? I said, yes, yes. Oh, you look so young. It was so painful to me because, number one, I didn't know what to say. Number two, she looks at me and she says, you are too what? So young. And then she says, but don't worry. Let me share with you what the Lord has done in my life. 
She started quoting scripture from Genesis to Revelation that she could remember. By the time she finished, it was time for me to pray. I can't even remember what I prayed, but I left the place and went away. And I said, there is power in the word of God. When I left that place, I was encouraged. I came back the following week. When I got there, she said to me, this time I am in so much pain. I don't know what to do. But please just pray. I prayed, and when I finished praying, she said to me, don't worry, even though I die, it's not an issue for me because I'll meet you on the resurrection morning. Make sure you are there. There are times when God will decide to heal you immediately. There are times when he allows you to go through it, but you are not alone. He is there with you. You can be too blessed to be stressed even in your situation because you are not alone. And this lady died. And a nurse who was nursing this lady, I was invited to preach at the funeral. And when I, after preaching, the, a lady came to me and said, Pastor, I remember you. I said, why? Where do you get, know me from? She said, you came to this old lady uh, to check on her. And I want to say to you today, I am here and I want the Jesus that was in this lady's life. Many people have died in my presence cursing and insulting God. But this lady was singing songs and telling us about the greatness of God until the day she died. And finally, the last one is the Bible is a faith builder. And let me just tell the story in the interest of time. I think you all know the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. This is my story. This is my song. It was written by Fanny Crosby. When she was two weeks old, <clears throat> she was diagnosed of an inflammation on the eyes. She was taken to a doctor. The doctor was so careless that it rendered her blind for the rest of her life. And at the age of eight, the parents took her and gave her to the neighbor. And the neighbor read the Bible to her. She could recite the four books of the New Testament from memory. And she wrote over 10,000 songs. And one of the songs she wrote is, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. This is my story. This is my song. When she was 80 years of age, she lived until then, they came to her and they said to her, what would you do if the man who made you blind was come to see you? And she said, if he was to come here, I would say to him, thank you so much for making me blind to the things of this world that I may see the things of glory. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. If you are here today, I want you to know there is power in the word of God. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song. I don't know if there is someone here who would like to sing this song and say, Lord, let this be my experience also, that I experience you each and every day of my life. If you are here this morning and that's your desire, please stand with me as we sing this song. Hymn number 462, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, ashes of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. Oh! 
my Savior. Chorus, one more time and watch us. Be my story. This is my song. Praising the Lord all the day long. I would like to invite my wife to come and pray. And as she comes, I don't know if there's anyone here. I know we are beyond time, but heaven is never beyond time. I don't know if there's anyone here who says, I want to renew my walk with Jesus. Or even there who are watching through Facebook or whatever. And you say, I want to renew my walk with Jesus. I want that which I saw there in the text be there in my life. You may be going through a challenging time, but you are saying, I want to give it all to Jesus. If that is your desire today, I want you to put up your hand as we pray. As we pillow is going to pray. I want you to put up your hand. And the Lord sees these hands. There may be someone here who has never been baptized. I never miss this. I'm sorry, timekeepers. I never miss this in my preaching because I know God always brings a soul hungry to join their lives to him. There may be one person here who wants to be baptized. Or wherever you are, just give your life to Christ. And if you are here and you want to re-baptism, or you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus, next week on the 10th, there will be baptism in this church. And you want to give your life to Jesus publicly, as he died for you publicly. Make your way to the front, and I'm here to meet you. Is there one soul that's ready to be baptized? And they want Jesus to be the Lord of their lives. Maybe you wandered into this place. Fear no man. You may be young, you may be old, but this is your time, your moment. Pastor is here to welcome you. Make your way. Jesus made it public. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. Whoever you are, wherever you are, this is the time, the moment of salvation in Jesus' name. Come to Jesus now. I remember in Malawi, well, I should have not mentioned the name, of the country because it's not my country. But I remember in that country I've mentioned it. A young girl who came and said, Pastor, do you think Jesus can save me? And I said, yes, he can. She said, my problem is that I can't sleep at night. At 12 midnight, a lady comes and he takes eight of us to the graveyard. We fly on a sheet. Can your Jesus do something about this? And I want to say to you today, it is history. That young girl was baptized in the name of Jesus. And she was set free from the power of the evil one. Is there one more who wants to come? Thank you, Pastor, for welcoming them. Because I am chained here. God bless you, my sister. Is there one more who wants to come to Jesus? He says, Jesus, these words I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have tribulations. But be of good cheer. Cheer up. This is your story. This is your song. Praise in the Lord, even in the midst of trouble. Why? Because Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Maybe your trouble is keeping you back. Your trouble is keeping you back. Listen to the text, what it says. It says, in this world, you'll have tribulation. You know the word tribulation 
simply means it is the same word that they use when they press grapes to produce juice. And sometimes life can press you and you think Jesus does not care. But the good thing is that Christ says life will press you, but life will not destroy you. Because you are in the hands of Jesus. It doesn't matter who is looking or who is not looking. Jesus is watching over you. Amen. Come to Jesus. It's a moment of salvation. If you want to come while we are praying, go ahead. Nicodemus came at night and he was saved. Over to Buipelo as she prays for us. Gracious Heavenly Father who art in heaven, we give you honor and glory for you are worthy to be praised. Indeed, there is none like you. Thank you, mighty Jesus, you who left the splendors of heaven to come and die for sinners like us. And as you've promised, Lord, you said, in this world we'll have tribulations, but we must be of good cheer. Yes, Lord, thank you so much for this reminder today. Your people may have been going through challenging times and some were at the edge of giving up. And I thank you, Lord, that this message has reached unto them to know that, Lord, in you they can have peace, peace that surpasses understanding beyond what challenging challenges of this world may have brought them. Dear Father, some may have be sick, dear Lord, or have the sick whom they are nursing, dear Father, and they are in a state of hopelessness. We thank you, dear Father, because in you, you have power even beyond the sicknesses that they may be going through. And some are jobless, Lord, or whatever challenge they may be going through. We thank you, dear Lord, for the reminder to say there's nothing that can stress us when you have you who have promised us everything. You said, Lord, there's nothing impossible with you, whatever challenges that they may be, they, we may be facing that may seem overwhelming. We know in you, dear Lord, we can have peace that surpasses understanding. Thank you, dear Father, for this reminder. In a very special way, we are so grateful for the souls that have come before you. We know there is joy in heaven when one sinner comes to you. What more, Lord, when many have decided, dear Father, to follow you this day. I pray a special blessing upon the young and the old who have stood, Lord, to to give their lives unto you. Oh, Father, I pray that from now henceforth they may never ever look back for this decision that they have made publicly, dear Father. May you honor them, dear Lord. The young, that they may grow to know you. The old, Lord, that they may hold fast to this promise, dear Father. Thank you so much for this decision. Bless them abundantly, even as they wait upon that time when they will join those who will be baptized. May you keep on being with them and hold them, Lord, with your righteous, righteous right hand, dear Father, that the devil may not lead them astray. Thank you, dear Father, for all your people that have raised their hands as a sign to say they surrender all unto you. May you meet each and every one of them at their point of need. For this we ask, trusting and believing in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.